Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency physician from Denmark working in Stockholm. And um, this lecture is a lecture that I gave for um, our interns. And um, it's all about when the scanner lies. I might as well have taken any kind of test and put it in there instead of scanner, because it's actually about you might you might apply this lecture for any kind of test that we do in the emergency department but i was asked to do this specifically about ct scans so the title is when the scanner lies and it's all about when we do tests but they don't tell us the answer so let's delve into this and what kind of pitfalls there uh, lies ahead when we are ordering these very advanced tests for our patients in the emergency department. Let's start off with a case. So you arrive at the emergency department for a handover and your colleague is running late, the one handing the patient over to you, that is. Um, so he wants to go up to morning report and so he just hands over the patient to you and only gives you the following information. In an S bar, he only managed to give you S and P. The S is patient comes in with headache. And P is if the scan is normal, you can send the patient home. And he'll be back later with details for the morning report. So at least in Sweden, and I guess all around the world, when you get this kind of handover, first of all, it's not that uncommon. Um, Second of all, it's it's a tricky situation because you uh, who are who are you who are the recipient of this handover um, is actually responsible for the patient, at least in in Scandinavia, at least in Denmark and Sweden, because you're the one who takes over the patient, even though the plan has been laid and afterwards there may be like all of us would probably agree that well it's probably more the responsibility of the uh, going the doctor handing it off if he managed to do 95% of the work but the one who is the recipient is actually um, just as culpable if you're just sending the patient home without thinking about why um, so this is a tricky situation for us and it's as I said a, a situation that we often uh, um, find ourselves in so let's try to move ahead and see um, what we can, wh well, what we can do about it. So, just when he leaves, maybe five or ten minutes after that, the scan comes back, and here's the scan. I mean, does it look normal? Even though you're not, even if you're not an expert at CT scan um, read-throughs, I will uh, encourage you to. Well, you can take a look at it for big things and systematically go through it, but uh, just as the radiologist without a good um, uh, a good history of why you you, you wanted the, the radiology to the radiology department to look at a the scan, then just as well you are in the blind here because you don't know what to look for, you don't know what kind of scan has been ordered maybe, and you don't know why this particular scan was ordered in this particular patient. You don't know anything about what we would call the pre-test probability. And if we want to take the take home message up front here, um, as I'd like to do in these lectures, then the scan or any kind of tests is nothing without the context. So we need context here. And so that's what we're like, that was, that's what we need all the time when we have to uh, interpret a test because without the pretest probability uh, or context then we cannot thoroughly um, interpret a, a result and just to show you and kind of get the wheels going in your head just to show you some kind of like potential scenarios what if this scan was let's say the the, the recipient came sorry the, the the handover guy came back came back um half an hour later and told you that well it was a 30 year old uh, female with monosymptomatic thunderclap headache well was the CT, ct scan good good enough then if it was if it was red normal what if it was a 50-year-old male with new features uh, with a new onset but non-specific headache? 
What if it was a 20 year old female with a headache on off, or a on off headache for the past maybe year? What if it was a 70 year old male with headache and altered mental status, let's just say? So we need context in these um, situations. So when the CC scan doesn't give you the answer, this is the lecture. And as I will argue, it never does. It's all about precess probability. Lies, lies, and probabilistics. Okay, so this is the first um, part of it. So we often think about a symptom. When the patient presents with a symptom, we, we, we and especially the patients often think about like, okay, we'll do this test, and if it's positive, then we have a diagnosis, and if it's negative, then we don't have a diagnosis, then we, then we can just send them home. And I know that you know that this is not true, but this is actually how we often practice, and I often practice like this. Um, but it's really, really important that we know the limitations of this kind of thinking, because there may be situations where this is totally fine, but oftentimes, especially in emergency medicine, we need to be more, a little bit more sophisticated about our tests. Just to show you that this is not something that I just make, make up, that we actually do this sometimes, let's try to give some examples here. So you hurt your ankle, okay, you do an x-ray of your ankle, and if it's positive, then there's a fracture, and if it's, no, if it's not positive, then there's no fracture. Well, if you want to delve into the details of probabilistics and orthopedics, then uh, I've made a, a lecture with, uh, with references here, so, we, so that you can delve into, it's a great and um, 10, 12 hour <laughs> part, uh, like a lecture series. Um, so yeah, <laughs> knock yourself out, but at least there are some good references there. Um, and I'll, uh, where, where I, where you can get a good overview of what this topic is all about in orthopedics. Okay. Let's say chest pain, you have a patient with, with chest pain and let's say like, you may be laughing, but we, this is actually what we do or used to do in the STEMI, non-STEMI paradigm. Well, if the patient comes in with chest pain and there's an ST elevation um, on the ECG, then if, this, if, it's, if there is a ST elevation and it's significant, then they go to P, um, the cath lab, the PCI. And if it's not a, a um, ST elevation, then they don't go to the cath lab. Of course, this is a while back, right, when we didn't have other criteria like the OMI criteria. And STEMI equivalence has been like, it's not a new term, but recently we, we turned to the OMI paradigm and, and I've made a video about that as well. So in general, this is what we would call a, like a dichotomous way of thinking. And that's not the way we should think about these things, at least in emergency medicine. So how should we think about it? And this is kind of a blue pill, red pill moment for people who have not delved into the probabilistic way of thinking in, in, in medicine. And I know like most of us kind of know intuitively about a lot of the things that I'm going to say here, but we don't necessarily practice that way. And that's what I want you to think about when we're do, going through this lecture. Okay. So. Either you take the blue pill and uh, stay stay in, in um, false dichotomy land, or you take the red pill and anguish with all the, the rest of us in probabilistic land, where nothing is certain and everything is uh, nothing is certain and, and everything is always kind of meh, some maybe maybe not. All right, but at least in probabilistic land we don't miss as much stuff. All right, so we want to move towards this, and this is not a this is not a thorough lecture on probabilistic thinking. This is more I try to apply it, and um, it's for the interns, so it's a bit um, it's a little bit uh, less sophisticated than some of the others. But if you're interested, and I don't think you necessarily um, don't need this uh, full lecture, then you, then you can just go to my homepage uh, or YouTube channel. Uh, here we are, and and I'll show you the links where, where I've talked a little more in details about the probabilistic thinking, about the um, cashier's threshold model, and about landscape of uh, illness, as I usually call it, and Bayes' theorem, and Fagan's normogram, and so on and so forth. But we'll be applying this uh, probabilistic thinking here. 
So here are some good references if you want someone else and this Dane uh, to talk about the, these things. Um, and I strongly encourage you to check these out before my videos. But these are really great. And if and, and I try to like summarize the points and try to bring it all uh, into just one video for your viewing um, pleasures. All right. These are my videos, just some of my videos on this topic. So you can check out the YouTube channel for these. All right. So first of all, as we start, started off, uh, started talking about in the beginning, no test without context. And context in probabilistic thinking is called pre-test probability. So let's say we have our headache patient here, and they, and what they say, and sorry for the Swedish here, but we, it was this 30-year-old woman with monosymptomatic thunderclap headache. What's, let's say that she's doing good right now. That, that would be a red dot here. And it, what, what if she's not doing too good right now? And it came even be, uh, while she's having sex. Uh, she may have had a syncope right when the headache started. And now she's a bit stiff in her neck. So we know intuitively, intuitively that this patient has a lower risk of having a thunderclap headache than this patient. Um, even be before going into the test, right? And we may even know that if we do the test on this patient, the test being a CC scan of the head, if we do the scan on this patient, we're probably all right to just send her home afterwards without knowing anything about the test or the test characteristics or the evidence about this. But we, we know that it's probably more all right to send this patient home than it is to send this patient home. And we can talk about all about how we gather the data and how, how, how high quality this, uh, depending on how we actually got, got the, gathered the data. But this is not that lecture. That's another lecture that I did. So you can check that out for the headache le lecture that I've done uh, previously, if you wanted to delve into that. But let's just say that this data is, is good. We got it in a good way. And, uh, and these are the two patients that we're looking at. So... But what is the like the pretest probability of this patient? And we could look up the like we could know the studies where it says that a thunderclap headache monosymptomatically in emergency departments in Sweden are around 10%. All right, but there's no studies about in, in these kind of patients because there's too there's just too rare, and there will never be studies on these kind of patients to assess the pretest probability. But we may we may know intuitively that if the, if the pretest probability here is around 10 percent, then it's probably around I don't know 30, 40, 50 percent up here. Remember, um, if you have a pretest probability of 10 percent, that means that 90 percent chance that it's not that as well. So a lot of these patients that we think have thunderclap headache may not have like in, in the majority of cases do not have anything dangerous going on. All right, so we we plotted here on the on the likelihood of a subarachnoid hemorrhage line from going from zero to hundred, and so the and the other differential diagnosis like well, there's ninety like there's one nine nine in ten chance that it's not thunderclap heading in this patient, and there's maybe this is just a guesstimate, right? So there's maybe an 60% chance that it's not bad in this patient. All right, so we need to choose a, choose a test for this. And which test is best? Well, so most tests are usually done in sensitivity and specificity, right? That's how we measure the accuracy and the greatness of a test, right? Um, if we meet, if we just want one more data point about that, then it's also the insurator reliability uh, of the test. But that's rarely something that we get um, too much of. But usually these are the ones that we get. So which of these three tests would be the best for any kind of condition? Would it be the first one with a low sensitivity and high specificity? Or would it be the opposite one with a high specificity, sensitivity and a low specificity? Or would it be this with a moderate to high sensitivity and specificity? Well, you may know about the uh, snout and spin mnemonic saying that if you have a test that is, well, snout is 
uh, sensitivity negative rules out. So if you have a highly sensitive test that is negative, then it rules out that uh, rules out the condition with a high probability, right? And if you have the spin, the specificity rules in. If it's high, then you have a uh, like. If this is maybe if it's negative, that doesn't change anything. But if it's positive, then it will certainly rule it in. And this one, if it's positive, well. I mean, it won't rule it in, but it will certainly help, right? Right? Well, this is kind of hard to, because like, as a rule of thumb, that's that's true, what I just said, the spin and snout. But there are details about it that kind of makes it hard sometimes to interpret whether the sensitivity and specificity is good enough for this. Um, one of the things is that, the two, like one of the things is that sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity is actually quite hard to interpret with, uh, next to each other. If we calculate the likelihood ratio, which is a much more useful, I think, and a lot of other <laughs> articles agree with me, uh, useful useful um, way of, of calculating this, the accuracy of a test, then you can see that this first test has a likelihood ratio of plus one and and minus one right meaning that it's if it's positive then it's it doesn't change the the the, the pretest probability at all it's the same if the pretest probability before was 10 percent then the, the after the test is still 10 percent and it's the same with the negative one and this one same same thing as well but this one even though it was only moderately high this is at least a little bit better um so without knowing anything else, the test number three is the one that is um, the better one in any sorts of circumstances, actually. But the rule, the rule of thumb of spin and snout still applies, but it's just there are pitfalls about it. And some of the pitfalls is that we cannot test or we cannot assert sensitivity isolated without knowing the specificity of a test and vice versa. And that's that's because like the likelihood ratio is calculated by combining both the specificity and the sensitivity. And it's quite easy to calculate. You can get, go to get the diagnosis and then you can find the calculations for it. And likelihood ratios are kind of like weights. So if we have a pretest probability of 10%, then depending on how good the test is, then the test acts like a weight to to um, to pull the sensitivity sorry to pull the uh, the, the the likelihood uh, the pretest probability up or down depending on whether the test is negative meaning negative likelihood ratio or positive positive likelihood ratios and if you have a really really good test then it will pull the pretest probability of 10% really up high right so um, and if it's negative then it will pull it really down low right but already now you may be noticing that if you're coming from really down low, like a previous probability of maybe 0.1 or 1%, as we do when we screen patients, then we will uh, be coming from really down low and we will apply a test that is really, really good. And even a really, really good test will maybe only get you, you up to 5% chance, right? But we but we think that when we screen positive in the population for cancer, then we think that we are a high certainty of having the condition, right? So what's all about that, right? <laughs> why are we why are we doing that? And <laughs> why are we not understanding these uh, these statistics or these um, basic probabilistic uh, concepts? Well, because we're human and it's not made for us, but it's something that we need to delve into and it's something that we need to know about. That's why we're doing, that's why I'm, I keep educating or I keep trying to talk about these things. And I mess it up all the time as well. This is not something that is necessarily natural to us, but it's something that we need to be aware of if we want to be good doctors. All right. All right. So you may you may ask why don't we just use the best test all the time for all everything? Well, I just said that it's kind of if you have a low 
low pretest probability and you use the good test, well, even the good test, which is often kind of radiation heavy and so on, is actually not the good test. The best test is assessing the pretest probability in a good way to begin with. And then if you're above the threshold, that's the Kashira threshold model. If you're above the fresh, the 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 threshold that you think that you're above the threshold to test your patient, then you test them. Um, but you need to do that kind of assessment first. So when the patient comes at to your, uh, or you come to the patient and they 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 after they've been waiting for six hours and they ask you, what is the like what is what does the test say? My uh, my first answer is always, well I. I can't really interpret it without knowing the history. So let's start with, start from the beginning. All right. So here are some of the, um, if you ever want to calculate, um, like if you want to know which tests have which likelihood ratios, at least the ones that are study and knowable, these are some great um, um, sources for that. So likelihood ratios are a bit uh, hard to grasp when you first come across them, but they're really important to know and to learn. So we have this, what you call a tennis rule of likelihood ratios. So it's just a rule of thumb to know kind of how much does the pretest probability change according to the likelihood ratio of a test. So um, if the likelihood ratio is plus two, then it changes 15% up or down. So likelihood ratio of plus two, the the same negative likelihood ratio, meaning if the test is negative, is 0 0.5. Um, for likelihood ratio of plus five, it, it will change 30% uh, up and down, and uh, sorry, oh, yeah, 0 0.2 here. And for one that is 40, that's game, right? That's If it, if it changes your precess probability 40%, then it's usually a rule in or rule out thing, right? almost whenever you have you done a good assessment to begin with another way of looking at it is through this table and i can just you can stop the, uh, if you want to delve through it but um as we'll come back to the most important uh, things are uh, like teaching points here are the the corners here the green ones and notice that like a ratio of one of a precess, if you have a precess probability of five and your like your test has a like ratio of one and you do it, then it doesn't change anything. All right, zero, it's it goes down and, and positive. Oh, sorry, if it's negative, it goes down and if it's positive, it goes up. Um, and notice here that this is the reason why the tennis rule is not totally accurate because it depends on the precess probability. So if you have a if you have a low precess probability and you you have a positive test, then it then it's then it increases for thirty percent, not the forty percent that we talked about earlier. But if you have one that is twenty, then it increases seventy percent, right? So it it like it, it depends on the pre it, it's associated with the precess probability. Therefore, it's not like it's not totally um, uh, uh, independent, uh, right? It's not independent from the the likelihood ratio is not independent from the pieces probability. So that's the entire thing. The test is not independent from the context, but it's um, but it's a good rule of thumb to begin with. All right, and then the accuracy of the likelihood ratio, like how good is it actually? Like, and this goes for the sensitivity and specificity as well. The, the, like the accuracy of it. It depends entirely upon the relevance and the quality of the studies. So studies done in not my emergency department, not in Scandinavia, um, and not in the population that I'm seeing, that doesn't necessarily apply. Or at least it at least should come with some caveats uh, and like thoughts about how do we extrapolate, extrapolate this knowledge from these studies that are done in a um, maybe an, an, an outpatient clinic uh, in Canada or in South Africa. Uh, how does that apply to my practice, right? And what is the integrated reliability? What kind of expert did that test? Um, and can I can, am I as good an expert in that field as that guy or that girl? So it depends on a lot of things: the integrated reliability, the quality of the study, and the the actually likelihood ratio of the, the test, right? 
if you want to read know more about that and check out uh, like the, the NNC where this quote comes from um, also like first NEM has great um, pages about this specific topic here yeah so let's go back to our patient there um, if you have a CC scan that is um, so we, we know from studies from Canada that the Perry and et al studies that if you have a CC scan within six hours you have a negative light ratio of 0 0.01 that's a really really good test right um, if we apply that and we can plot it into the Fagans normogram here, making well where you have the test in the middle, you have a pre-test probability out here. It's the same thing that, we, that like this, just in a normogram. <laughs> so and and so you have 10% here, and then you do the test, and it's minus um, zero. It's it's negative, and it's 0 0.01, right? Then the post-test probability goes down way below here. Same thing if you have the syncope patient, then it's 40% and then it goes down, but it com comes out post-test probability of, of 0 0.5. So you'll be missing one in 200, where it's, whereas it's, um, whereas it's uh, down here, it's maybe one in, I don't know, more than 500. It depends, right? 500 is here and it's got, it's, it's one in thousand maybe. Um, So we, we don't need calculators for what we do in the emergency medicine. We just know, need to know kind of this, like this theory about how, like, <laughs> like pre-test probability and post-test probability and how the test is actually the same test. So is the test good or not? Is the test normal or not? Well, whether or not, well, it may be interpreted normal, but whether or not we interpret that results as a rule out, really depends on the pre-test probability, right? How is the patient doing? And what kind of pre probability do we have for this? This is just for the specific diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the take home point about this first part is, well, even though no matter what kind of test you have, it's all about the context, right? All of these things, all of these tests if you have just one test here and it's negative, as you see, the negative like ratio, this may be a decent test depending on what kind of pretest probability you have. If you have a high pretest probability, then it doesn't rule it out. If you have a low pretest probability, then it does rule it out. And one of the take homes here, um, if we go to the next slide, is that if we do have a very low pretest probability, but we have and we have a good test, that means that like this is this this is kind of the screening thing, then we will only go up to maybe thirty or forty percent. That means, well, I mean, even though it's, your test is positive, even though it does look like you have ST elevations on your ECG, you don't have any chest pain. And I, this is just a thing, like a thought up example. It, I don't know if it's a pre-test probability. It's probably way lower, right? If you're screening someone with an ECG on the street, and they have a bit of a, like ST elevation that lives up to the criteria, then um, even though the test is really good, then it's probably not it. Or then process of probability is not that high, not that high. It's, it's high enough to work you up, definitely, but it's not high enough, like. So you need more here. And the key message is here that we shouldn't just throw, throw out tests to people. We need to assess their risk. And that's what we don't do when we do screening. And that's why screening is quite controversial, um, for uh, unless for really specific topics, right? On the other hand, if you have something with a high pre-test probability and you have a really good test, even though the test is really good, then because of your pre-test probability is being really high, you cannot rule that patient's case out. All right, so um, hmm. So if we have someone who definitely, definitely have the, had a thunderclap headache and all the criteria and so on and so forth, even a good test may sometimes not be enough to rule that out. And that's why in some cases it's, good, it's a good idea to do the lumbar puncture even though your test is negative. Right, and if you want to look at that uh, in the in this table instead of the Fagans normogram, you can check it out here. 
So this is the low priestess probability with a good test only increases a little bit, right? From five to thirty. That's not enough to say the rules in it's ruled in. Um, needs more workup, right? Um, and same thing goes with your um, high priestess probability and your negative test. That is good, but process probability of a ten percent. I mean, that's not below the acceptable miss rate for most dangerous conditions, right? The audit dissection. Oh, I'm just missing one in ten if I'm doing this test. Let's say audit dissection history, patient with Marfan's, and uh, you take you use the test as a D-dimer, even though the D-dimer test is quite good. And it's not good enough to rule it all the way out, right? I'm sorry, I think this is 19, it's 1 in 5 even. It's not 1 in 10, it's 1 in 5, that's even worse. <laughs> All right. So, if you don't remember anything without, like from this lecture, just remember no test can be interpreted without a context. All right, next one. Next um, take-home point here. Positive tests guide management and negative tests demand a good plan before ordering the test. Hmm. So this is one of the mantras in probabilistic thinking that if we order a test, we should always think about what we do if it's negative. So when, you, when, I'm, in, when I'm in the emergency department and I want to test someone with a CT scan, like if it's positive, then it's, well, then it's a slam dunk usually just into the emergency, into the department, right? I can even admit the patient in the wait for the CT scan if I'm really sure, right? But if it's negative, I mean, that's good. Like, there was this great article about delivering good news. But oftentimes the reason why you did the CT scan was because the patient was in so much pain or in such a bad condition that you kind of wanted to rule dangerous conditions out. But now we, oftentimes we stand after the negative test with, with a patient who has the same amount of complaints. Not always, but oftentimes the same amount of complaints, same amount of pain, but... The CT scan is negative, and then we're, then we're in this like no man's land sometimes, like with the patient. So, do we keep going with more tests, or are we satisfied? And it's quite important to actually have that conversation with the patient before you order the scan, and not afterwards. Because if you do it before you order the scan, then you can expect uh, manage their expectations early on, right? So. Most patients, as we, as we saw, uh, as we saw with the CT scan of the head example or in thunderclap headache, most patients that are negative that, that don't that have a negative scan, or sorry, most patients that come in with a like potential serious condition actually don't have it. Right? If you have ten patients coming in with severe uh, chest pain, only maybe one in one in three or one in ten or whatever will have a thunder. Uh, sorry, a, um, a aortic dissection, but it's unreasonable not to do the scan, and you need to know to, what to do about the patient before ordering the scan. So if it's negative, well, then we'll either ex like manage expectations with the patient before and say, well, we don't need to do anything more. And then I'm satisfied with that. All the critical conditions, or time critical conditions, are below a, a um, um, acceptable post test. Uh, probability threshold or you will say like well even if this scan is negative we have to do more all right so 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 it's really important to have this conversation before going into the scans we call it flying ahead of the plane and um so if you, if you practice like this in the emergency department then you kind of know what to do once the once you get to the point when the scan when the, when the scan comes and the answer is positive positive okay well then when we just do whatever I, my plan is because that's what I thought and if it's negative well then I also do what I planned because I've already planned for that hmm. all right let's look at this <clears throat> two by two table and it's this is a two by two table you, you all know from your your um like medical or sorry um your um education like basic education in medicine so so you have a patient who is sick or not sick and then you have your positive test or a negative test 
So now if we think about the CT scan here in these terms. When we order our scan, like the scan of the head for this patient, it may be true positive. There, there is blood and the patient does actually have the condition. Well, hooray! Or not for the patient, but at least we caught it, right? Or it could be true negative. These are the two, like this is the dichotomous way of thinking, right? And um, as we'll, I'll just quickly say as a parenthesis here that this entire thing is kind of also really dichotomous in a way because people are not either sick or not sick and the test as we'll see is not either positive or negative it's a spectrum on these both uh, like the x and the y axis but in simple terms we have either true positive or, or we have this kind of uh, like man, ma matrix here so um Either you have a true positive or a true negative. These are like that's the like the first like the dichotomous way of thinking. Like over oh, the test is either that or that. But like one step ahead of that is to know that there's something called false positives and false negatives. And you all you all know this, but it's quite hard to like grasp in the clinic when we find ourselves in that situation. We don't kind of know. We don't really know when we are in that situation. So let's go through them one by one here. All right, so you have the scan, there's something on it. Is it true positive or is it just just false positive, this thing? Well, let's say it's true positive or what is true positive actually? Well, this is a great, um, this is a great curve uh, or graph from Gilbert Walsh's book, um, Overdiagnosed. And in general, um, you have the uh, spectrum of illness here. So let's say whatever condition you found on the CC scan has a spectrum, right? So you have the really, really severe conditions where it's, uh, I've tried to mark it with red, like really big. And you'd have the mild uh, conditions, really, really mild uh, on the other side here. All of these is the same disease. Like if you took a biopsy from that part, that, that thing, it's the same disease, but at this end of the spectrum, it's really severe. And in this end of the spectrum, it's mild, so mild that the patient would never have had any trouble if it wasn't found. And this is what we define as overdiagnosis down here that at this level. So even though it's a true positive finding, we may kind of scratch our heads at whether or not this actually is the reason for their symptoms at this point. Um, but at this point uh, in time, we, 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 we are probably uh, quite um, sure that this is the cause of their symptoms uh, if, if we did the scan. And also if we look, take a look at the graph, what Gilbert, Gilbert Welch is, um, what he assumes, and I think that's not unwise, is that the benefit of treatment uh, goes up as the severity of the condition um, or the spectrum of the illness goes up, right? So the ones who has the most to gain from a treatment, those are the ones that has the most severe condition. So for instance, if you have hypertension of a 220 uncontrolled, you have a high benefit of being treated for that. While if you have a lower risk condition, but still kind of like blood pressure of maybe 150, 160, you still have a big, um, you, have, you still have a benefit of being treated as opposed to the ones on the other side here where, where it becomes so mild around 140, maybe 135 or whatever the border line is right now. Um, then then you may have problem, uh, may have more um, harm done to you than benefit by being treated, and why is that? Well, that's because the harm curve, I mean, the harm of a bit of the treatment, this is, doesn't necessarily um, uh, take that doesn't take into account what like what kind of severity of illness you're being treated for. And Gilbert Wells is, uh, Gilbert Wells admits that it may be wobbly a little bit. For some conditions, the harms may be going up. As well as like with, with severe of conditions, I can think of in emergency medicine where you have thrombolysis for PE, 
um, well, th thrombolysis in someone who's doesn't who doesn't have any like P or at least not severe P, is not that troublesome as someone who actually does have it. Right? There's a higher risk of bleeding in someone who's severely sick. Um, sometimes, so so it, it it's not totally true that it's just a, a plain line, but it's maybe a wobbly a little bit. For some conditions, maybe their their harms are less as well. So, but it's more or less stable as opposed to the benefit curve so you can get this benefit harm uh, ratio and the benefit harm ratio is great here but it's not great down here right here is on here it's like there's more harm done than good being diagnosed with this and if we want to treat it so that's the nuance in the true positive if we find something on the scan well the harms do the harms outweigh the benefit of actually treating this or actually diagnosing the patient with this um, even though it's true disease as opposed to some of the other things here this is true disease it would, it would under the microscope but it would never harm the patient if it's below like in the really mild end and there's lots of harms that comes with being diagnosed like that all right, so that's the nuance in that point. Let's go. Let's go on to the next one. So, and this is the condition where we we talk about like, well, false negatives, great. Uh, so sorry, true negatives. Well, the scan is negative, great. We don't have to do anything. But the patients oftentimes still have concern concern that, well, was this scan really done the right way? Um, this can be. I must have something from this like for the reason that's the reason for this condition that i'm having right are you sure that you have worked me up in the good in, in like the correct way should i get another scan i want to know what it is that's usually the kind of the, like the anxiety um, often anxiety provoked but like like they want to know and part of what we do as emergency physicians is that we kind of keep patients from get from getting the unnecessary tests or like keep with we kind of the at least in in this in, in sweden or where there's like people can just walk into the emergency department as opposed to in denmark and norway we are the gatekeepers oftentimes um, as along with the other primary care um, physicians and um, uh, providers we are the like gatekeepers to the system and if we keep them we if we keep the patient from getting tests um then we then we can often and we oftentimes don't have to steer them into the system if we use time as a test, right? Um, expectation, expectative management, right? So that this, this, can, this, the problem often arises if the patient wants to know, and we really, really don't want to go down that path. Which is, I see that like at least a couple of times a week, and maybe every day actually, in a lot of patients, if we don't kind of prepare the patient before doing the scan and that's kind of the take home here so even though the scan is negative we kind of got to, like as i already alluded to we kind of got to know what do we want to do if the scan is negative and we probably should have that kind of conversation with the patient even before right all right so if you think the process probability after the test is low and you rule out other time critical conditions how do you get the patient with severe symptoms home? As, as I say, as I said, um, it starts with the beginning of the encounter. We need to use compassionate care. Get the patient, get them to the next step. Um, so compassionate care. I've done an entire lecture about that, but in in the shortest amount of time I can say it. This is all about um, when the patient meets a doctor. You need to make them better. As a product of your meeting with them, and it's all about having a combination combination of listening and being being like empathic like having empathy towards the patient but also um, taking a step half a step back and actually thinking about what can we do about this condition getting them to the next step all right is is really really important and not just um, not just having empathy but also trying to get them to the next step um, and the next step may like part like it's 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 hard to have symptoms and and we want to get them to the, to to a um, like we want to make them a little better, right? 
not cure them or not and not make them fi not fix the problem but uh, we would love to do that as well but oftentimes that's not possible so we want to do just a little better okay and that little better is often uh, talking about why what, what we should do if the test is negative beforehand right so we kind of kind of already have the plan then expectation management is also part of the part of it we already talked about that like hi my name is peter if is this if this scan is negative then we're not going to do any more because uh, i'm not afraid of any time critical conditions uh, that, um, that 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 could also be the problem here because you you are you have a two though uh, probability of those right so i will recommend that if this is negative then i'm not afraid and then we can just go then i'm not um, concerned and then you can just uh, go home and then do some like have some days and then then if it comes back or if it becomes worse or if some new symptoms develop then come back okay so it's like expectation management with with the safety netting as well then of course we need to validate their symptoms and oftentimes patients patients don't really um we do all these things uh, we think uh, for the patient but uh, actually they don't really realize oftentimes that we're doing these things they will come back uh, to the next the next day or the next doctor and saying they didn't do anything for me in the emergency department and that's usually because we didn't listen to their symptoms and validate their concerns right um and validate the, the burden of being in the emergency department and validating everything like about like being a patient and, and having to wait for 16 hours in a, a emergency department in Stockholm, like overnight with concerns of having some kind of horrible condition and so on and so forth. All of this, right? It's all about this. And I've, I've, I, I won't go into details about this anymore, but I've, I've made several lectures on this as well on in, in the compassionate care lecture and, and in the, and my headache lecture. Yeah. All right. Safety knitting. We talked about that. I usually like to write out a three-step written plan, uh, always in threes, so that it's can, it can be remembered by the patient and and, and me as well. Uh, it can be more steps though, but but in general, it's it's good to have like step one, you do this; step two, you do this; step three, you do this. And I often write it down for them so that they get home with something in their hands, physical, physical. And then, yeah, listen to the story, and it's all about also the compassion and care and how to take a good history. So sit down, listen to their story, and so on. And then don't interrupt them. Um, and then when you're done, then you give them the story back. Right? That's part of the validation thing as well. Like they need to understand what we've done for them, right? And if you don't understand, then you'll come back tomorrow, or they won't be compliant with our advice. So, or adhering to our advice, right? It's all about shared decision making. In this. All right. So that's the true negative ones. Um, they're usually like, they often easy if you if you kind of already set the stage for what is going to be done if you have a negative CT scan. Then the false positives. This is a um, area that is more hard, right? So this is not an overdiagnosis. False positives are not an overdiagnosis. This is not in the microscope anything. If you took a biopsy of it or you took the microscope out and, and looked at it, this is not the true disease. This is a um, this is a shadow. This is a um, something that looks like it, but isn't it, right? It's a filling defect in the CT scan of the pulmonary embolism, right? It's a um, yeah, it's a shadow. And the statistically savvy people would usually say, well, if it's a false positive, then just repeat the test. But sometimes the tests are hard to get, or expensive, or uh, harmful for the patient. So even though it, it is true, if we could just repeat the test, and we often do that with blood samples, right? If I, I mean, oh, the blood samples will be like one in 20 blood samples will usually be a little bit high for no reason. And if that's the case, then we usually will follow up at, at primary care. And if it keeps being high, then it's probably not a false positive. And, it's, and it may be uh, an incidentaloma, something that is not because of the condition, but it may be something else, right? It's something to maybe work up or just... Um, let be depending on the severity of it. So are we sure this positive finding is real? And how do we know about that? Well, the short answer is it all comes down to pre-test probability, right? If you test it at a low pre-test probability rate, oh sorry, if you test it at a low pre-test probability and and the test came back positive, then there is a much higher chance of it being false positive than it being true positive. 
And if you want to know the maths about that, then check out First Ten Yems um, uh, blog on. Um, it's called precess probability. Uh, why is it? Why is it essential to know about precess probability? Something like that. All right. So the problem with false positives, uh, and there's, and this actually also goes for the overdiagnosis, like the true diseases that are so mild that they don't cause any harm. Um, if 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 you are, if if you have if you test this patient, and their test is positive, then then like we interpret it as positive, then that's a false positive scan. Then you get some kind of false positive diagnosis, and that then you usually meet the admission for that. And then there's more tests, and further out you may be um, you may 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 have some kind of biopsy, and if that that biopsy is positive, then or false positive or indeterminate, then you need more. Like it just keeps going, right? This is usually for. This is also true for incidentalomas. You just keep on going on, like, and incidentalomas are not false positives. They're not f true positives either. They are indeterminate, so so to speak. But oftentimes they carry a low risk, but it's too high a risk to us to just let them go. It, but oftentimes it's better to not just not just let them go. But in our current environments, we we're not. Um, if we got the test and we, we saw the incident incident then it's kind of hard to let it go. So the be it's better to just talk about with the patient the risk of incident incidentalomas and false positives and and also true positives, but at the mild end of the spectrum, because these are things that will not help them. All right, but and one of the thing problems with with the um, with this cascade of carries, like kind of actually a double whammy, because if this test is po false positive, sometimes the actual diagnosis for the re like the reason why they came to the emergency department that is going missed, right? Because we anchor on this thing. Oh, this must be the reason why we found this thing on the blood samples that we shotgunned, or we found this uh, thing on the CT scan that we found. Well. We missed the actual diagnosis, right? It's out there somewhere still, and maybe that's just a biopsycho, like maybe it's a psychosocial phenomenon, right? As most things are, like symptoms are the rough, like as Bernard Laun would say, symptoms for patients are usually for all of us is uh, are, are, are a um, reflection of the rough and tumble of life, right? It doesn't have to have a diagnosis. Um, but sometimes, every, every now and then, there's a time-critical diagnosis that is going missed because we look at the first fracture and, and the most commonly fra like most common fracture missed is the second one, right? That's called satisficing. All right. So, and there's even studies on this. Reassurance after a diagnostic test with a lower pre probability of a serious disease. So, this is Rolfi and Al, and they did a, did a systematic review and metal analysis and just... The, the um you can check that out yourself but in general it just says um if you test someone at a low pre like low test like low precess probability as a reassurance oh i just want to make sure that it's not that then usually you harm the patient and there's this great article by kaiser so, uh, and so on that doing something if the if there's a lower precess probability um then that's probably better than doing something oftentimes so do nothing that's the Deliberate clinical inertia. We actively do nothing because we have assessed that it's better to not do anything. Are we there? Are we there yet? Well, yeah. I promise this lecture is actually about false negatives. That's usually what we want to do when the scans when the scan lies. So all of this we just talked about. That's just like the groundwork and the um, the um, like the other ways that the scan can lie that we usually don't think about. <clears throat> but before we get to the false negatives, let's just talk about um, these incidents lomas, right? So, okay, you get the scan, everything is fine. Let me just send you on your way. And oh, not a radiologist has just joined the conversation. It says, "What's that?" So, um, yeah, we we we've all. Like hopefully the patient is still in, in departments. Hopefully it's still daytime so that the specific 
neurosurgeon consultant can be consulted about this patient so that we don't have to keep the patient's uh, details at our person and call them tomorrow at our um, in between other patients to to ask them whether or not they are interested in being worked up for this minor very very minor like incident sedoma that probably probably isn't anything but we can't really be sure thing that's what an incident sedoma is right Again, we have the cascade of care. Um, it's something that is randomly found in a CT scan. We didn't look for it, um, but now it's there, and it is still on, like it's in on like the most common one is the the, the kidney incidentalomas, and I think there's this article in overdiagnosed overdiagnosis literature that talks about um, it's called. Uh, if, if there's more CT, if you, if you, in regions of the United States where you do more CT scans than less, there's not a difference in mortality or morbidity. The only difference there is in the, in the areas where they do more scans is that people have fewer kidneys because they are usually taken out. Because we cannot, if we found it, find an incidentadoma, let go of it. All right. But actually, we, 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 we should be able to, because you just in, inform the patients about the risks. But, you know, we're not that good at risk assessment ourselves, and the patients are probably not either, oftentimes. So, again, the better, re the better way is to actually never do the scans. And once we do have the scan, at least we should inform the patients about the risks involved. And if you don't want to know how to do that, I've made le le lectures on that as well in overdiagnosis lectures. But also check out Gerd Giegerens, a German psychologist in, in this kind of thinking. All right. And the problem with incidentalomas, as we talked about, it, it, it's like it never ends the follow-ups, right? And you might end up with not having a kidney afterwards. And that may have been a good thing, but not always. And again, we can miss the actual diagnosis. And there are so many problems with, like, now we talk about false positives, mild conditions, called over, which we call overdiagnosis, when it's more harm than good for the patient to actually know about this and will never in their patient's lifetime actually cause harm to them and then also um and then also these um incidentalomas it's both physiologically problematic for the patient because they usually are admitted and they have to do tests and so on and so forth but also mentally task uh, like uh, to having taking a toll on the patient mentally right because we don't want to be patients and susan sontag has this great um quote that iona heath has pulled out and if you like iona heath uh, is this general practice physician who has talked a lot about overdiagnosis google her and read her articles and watch her videos she's so great um but she she brings forth this uh, uh, this um uh, poem i think about it from Susan Sontag, and she writes, illness is, uh, illness is the night side of life, a more onerous uh, citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. So we have two passports, right? Although we all prefer to use a good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of the other place. Yeah, sorry, it's not a, probably not a poem, but it's more of a, a small narrative here. And that's the essence of it. Like, we change when we become patients. We change the way we look at life. We change the way that insurance, like we are being insured if we get a diagnosis. We, we look at everything different. And sometimes it's good to kind of get a wake-up call about our mortality, but usually it's not pleasant. And especially not if it's filled with this uncertainty that there's always that there always is there's usually not a clear answer and we don't want to like <laughs> uncertainty is already uh, is already like it, it's all where uh, uh, all where it's everywhere it's something that is inevitable in medicine like this and i like i talked about this times and times again and arabella simpkins and Catherine montgomery and much like a lot of all the other smart people have talked about this the um, the 
on like the the uncertainty that cannot be like diminished less than that it is like there will always be uncertainty irre irreducible uncertainty there will always be irreducible uncertainty and this can like tear at our soul when we're doing work workups and this yeah so this is important that we don't call patients 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 unless we really have to and usually use time as a test instead of doing these good like these really really sensitive or specific tests all right so now i'm done this is the that's the incident loma now we can go on to the <laughs> false negative ones here the reason why you probably came to this lecture so thank you for sticking sticking along i think this is um the other things are as important or uh, oftentimes as important um to know about so now we've got the entire spectrum of this so false negatives and this is what we i guess as emergency physicians and everyone we're kind of scared of that it's that it like we did the scan it's negative but the patient had the condition anyway and there's lots of reasons why the patient had the condition anyway it's not just about the scan right so let's just look at some of the points for why the scan is negative but it, the patient had the condition anyway well if we start off at the encounter if we say, say this is the start of the encounter this is the end of the encounter then it can go go wrong in several places and often goes wrong in several places well maybe we didn't gather the data like we we did what we would call what i usually call um we um lead we let the victim right we let the patient into a trap when we asked about the thunderclap headache we asked we asked very specific questions really early on did it come fast did it uh, did it develop really quickly uh, and uh, like uh, or sorry did it come fast and was it severe and patients will usually when when will ask specifically about things like at a yes no answer then usually will say yes um, at least in the emergency department when, when they've been waiting and they think that maybe they think the only reason or the only way they, they can get a thorough workup which sometimes in their minds is a CT scan or an MRI that's is by like like overstating their symptoms right but yeah but so so we 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 could be leading the victim into a like oh it wasn't actually a thunderclap headache we we misclassified this condition um when we gathered the data right and that's i i sometimes call that the consultant's dilemma right because our consultants never know if if it, it, if they don't know you um, then they don't know what to do about the data collection that you present for them, right? They don't know the quality of it. They just know that it's there, but they don't. Know, they don't know how to how you actually came about it. And when I'm in triage and I'm um, when I'm being asked questions about patients, then uh, then this is something I constantly think about. Like, what is the how did you ask these questions? And it's not always something that we have the time to actually assess, but sometimes if it's a really inexperienced doctor or um, someone who who may, or I get a feeling of, well, this is not probably not a well-taken history, then I want to see the patient myself, right? Sometimes it's just hard, even though we do everything right, sometimes it's just hard. So we may have gotten, gotten the data gathering wrong. Um, and if we get the get data gathering wrong, then down the line, the downstream effects of that, well, if it wasn't a thunderclap headache, then uh, then maybe it was something else, right? It was actually um, it was actually something totally different, and we made the wrong scan. And it's kind of the same when we talk about the interpretation of the data. Maybe we collected all the data right, but we didn't have the knowledge that um, that the patient with with a syncope uh, actually in, that it actually increased the risk of a um, of a, a thunderclap or, or a subarachnoid hemorrhage or uh, so there's knowledge involved there are also biases involved maybe maybe we didn't consider some things when we interpreted the data um, and so 
we may have anchored too early or premature close close too early on on, on what kind of data it was right so the, the data collection collecting bit is really important and, and that might lead us to to order um a wrong scan because we didn't know or because we were biased towards something or we didn't take the good history um, to actually assess what what the precess probability was for the conditions then we could also fail at conveying what we know to the radiologists. So um, we may order a CC scan on our patient that was not really with the question of this is a is, is this a thunderclap headache in the like in the um, our like concerning diagnoses uh, to the radiologist. And we may just write bleeding question mark. And if we said that the patient's syncopias and had a headache uh, in the history, but not a thunderclap headache, and we just said, well, they think syncopias, then the, the radiologist may think that, oh, this is a trauma CT scan. And then they don't look too closely on, on the subarachnoid hemorrhage things, right? So, and that's not, not their problem. I mean, uh, that's not their fault. Um, of course, they have to do a scan systematically, or they have to look through the scan systematically, but they're not robots and robots would not be like any like it's the same problem as i've been talking about all the time here they look at the test but if they don't know the context then the test is no good i mean of course if they have some obvious pathology but it's still then even though they still need to look at it in context and we often get this answer back from the radiologist well this could be it it, it could be this or it could be that but it really needs like like apply with clinical context, right? Or or um, uh, interpret uh, in clinical context. So also we could we we could we could order the wrong modality, like well wrong, right scan, right? Uh, we we did a good um, like a good. Um, um, a referral to this CT scan, right? We, we, we wrote up a good referral, um, but for some reason, and that's usually the like that's usually sorry the uh, radiologist's um, responsibility to actually order the right scan depending on what kind of questions we're asking. But if the questions we're asking, like maybe if we ask fifty questions or two like or, or ten sorry or ten questions, like could this be this or this or this or this? And we haven't really, sometimes there are some patients where we really can't narrow it down and we need to do one scan first and then the other. But oftentimes it's because we, we kind of lack experience or we don't have a good grasp of the precess probability or we don't know, like, we haven't thought about it good enough. And, you know, sometimes, Sometimes you just uh, like don't know that there are other modalities and th that have, that have different lecture ratios, right? So, a um, a normal like a a common um, problem here is if you maybe um, a classical problem here is if you ask like you have you have your 80 year old patient who has kidney stones since uh, like who has had kidney stones before, you order a normal CT scan of of the flank. Um, uh, over the the abdomen to just look for kidney stones, and if that's negative, then you think oh, that's all right, and th then we don't have any cause for the for the, then we don't have any like kidney stones. That's then you, you can go home, but you miss that the normal CT scan or the CT scan without contrast that we do for kidney stones doesn't rule out aortic aneurysms, and 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 that's a common miss. All right, so you need to think about is this are we going to do a normal CC scan or we or sorry a CC scan well contrast are we doing going to do arterial contrast are we doing to do venous contrast and so and different differential diagnoses can be ruled out more or less in these different scans but usually not all of them at the same time sometimes you need to, to need to do sequential scans and with a lot of radiation but sometimes that's necessary but usually you can do it just with one one scan if you are smart about it. All right, and then you can have technical issues. Well, uh, or the interpretation was wrong, right? 
like we do everything that we can, uh, everything we did was right, but the interpretation of the original is wrong. They're human too, right? Um, and that's why they have uh, several uh, colleagues who often looks, look through their scans. Um, and we probably should do that as well in clinic uh, with patients. Uh, ask our colleagues um, much more than we do, but it's important. It's almost impossible to get uh, to ask every patient with uh, with your colleagues, right? Or it may be a technical issue, like um, the scan was low quality, or or some other reason, right? And then lastly, and this, this is not a thorough list, but just some of the points, right? The scan cannot rule that out. So the scan you ordered was negative, but you weren't aware that just because that scan is negative, it's not a good enough test to get you below the acceptable miss rate post-test probability, right? The previous probability was 80, and this scan is all right. Like the ultrasound is all right here, or the CT scan is all right here. But it, so if it's negative, like you go below, maybe maybe your process probability is only 10. But it, that's usually like missing one in 10 of these, like time critical conditions is not acceptable, right? And then sometimes that one in 10 is the one patient that you have in front of you. So you need to know how good the tests are at ruling out different conditions. An example could be your your 40 year old patient with low sudden low abdominal pain who comes in screaming and you do the CT scan with contrast and maybe with double contrast with both arterial and venous and it's negative right job done everything's all right no um, you need to consider the other differential diagnosis on this and again look at my other lectures about how to think go about thinking in emergency medicine but this could be a torsion right and torsions are not necessarily ruled out by cc scans even though it's a good test it's not good enough to rule them out it requires an ultrasound and a gynecologist and waiting and laparoscopy as well so all right so what's the what's the um, what's the solution to these? Well, for this like data gathering, we need to know about like we need to know about probabilistics. We need to be a good com good communicators and be aware of how to collect data, how to co how to both collect data by examination and also collect data by talking with our patients. Sit down, ask broad questions to begin with, listen and don't interrupt and know about what kind of conditions you want to rule out after a while and ask specific questions after that. When interpreting the data, we need to practice cases. It's hard to interpret data, so we need to practice this, practice, practice, how to like go through cases and what, what things to weigh in and what not to weigh. And then we need to know about the cognitive biases. Don't do satisficing, like looking for the first structure and missing the second one. Um, think about premature closure. Like, don't don't think you have the diagnosis set from the begin from the get go just because everything lines up to think that that is the reason for the symptoms. And then have good habits. Um, do forcing strategies. So, like, your patient with monosymptomatic thunderclap headache. Um, okay, so she has thunderclap headache. Um, what other conditions that a normal CC scan does not rule out do we want to think about? And this may be uh, our CVS, like um, this may be CVST, um, which requires different kind of scans, right? So forcing strategies could be this is not it, like saying to yourself, this is not it, like the condition that I'm thinking of, this is not it. What could it be otherwise? It could also be assessing the probably like the like the probability of all other conditions. All right, so if you have your previous probability of 10% and then the rest, what is the rest of like the reasons why the patient has the symptoms? That's 90%, right? 100% minus 10%, that's 90%. So what what highs in those 90% and are there any dangerous conditions in those 90%? If the, if the answer is yes, then you should probably 
think about what we should do once that first scan comes back and is negative, right? Maybe you would need sequential, uh, sequential CC scans. Maybe you need other tests. For conveying the message to the radiologist, then please just write good um, referrals to the radiologist, right? CT scan referrals. Think about what kind of questions you're actually asking and describe the presupposition so that the radiologist can assess it themselves, right? With the scan in front of them. And for which kind of modality? Well, know the different modalities and know that, that you need to sometimes ask a radiologist, especially if you have some kind of differential diagnosis that may lie between the different modalities. Oh, I think this could mis be mesenteric ischemia, but also it could be it could be appendicitis, right? Well, sometimes one is more serious than the other or more likely than the other. Then it's discussion with your with your doc, with your radiologist whether a um, arteriogram is better or a venogram is better. Usually the arteriogram will root out the mesenteric one, right? But the venogram, but the appendicitis which will, will probably be seen on the arteriogram as well, even though the venogram is better, it's probably good enough. So sometimes you just have to call your radiologist and discuss what kind of modality is the best one. And sometimes you have to do several scans, sequential scans, right? Um, Technical issue or wrong interpretation? Well, there's nothing really to do about it other than create good systems and um, be aware that we're all human and we need to learn from our mistakes. But uh, even radiologists makes mistakes, right? So uh, we need to know about this. And um, if things don't fit with our picture, repeat it. Like if the if the, if it's really a classical thunderclap headache history, but the CT scan is, is said it's read negative, then, and maybe it's a new doctor on the radiology department who's read it, right? And first of all, read, read the scans yourself, not that, not because our radiology colleagues are not good at it, but because we mean, we may, even though we try to convey all the good data to them, we are the ones who are the closest to the patients, and we are the ones who maybe know something that is not conveyed in the, in the, in the referral to the radiologist, we need to kind of look at the scans ourselves. Um, especially if the things don't fit. And then maybe if it doesn't fit, then maybe admit the patient for observation or maybe do a lumbar puncture in the in the case of thunderclap headache because we're kind of worried, even though the CT scan was normal. And for this, like, we need to know the ballpark large ratios for common tests. Yeah. So this is why the CT scan can be negative, some of the main reasons, right? We ordered the wrong one or the wrong modality. Um, we didn't convey to the radiologist, so they either didn't, like, either missed it or never looked for it because we didn't tell them to look for it. Um, or we don't. We or we ordered a test that has that like the CT scan. Well, it's a good CT scan, but it's not good enough with the high precise probability to rule this condition out. Like, I can't rule out this ovarian torsion with the CT scan. All right. So let's go back to our case. The patient. Oh, sorry. The the guy has now been uh, at the morning rounds for an hour <laughs> and twenty minutes. Right. He finally comes back and. Gives you this history. Um, so you think about this fag and snowmogram that I showed you, um, or at least pre probability, and say like, okay, 30 year old female with monosymptomatic thunderclap headache. We just ran through that. Then she has, a, if that if that CT scan was done within six hours, that's probably good. If it wasn't done within six hours, then we meet we need to consider the lumbar puncture, right? Um, especially if, like within six hours and it has to be done like interpreted by a experienced radiologist that's also part of the studies and it has to be a new CT scan it can't be a 50 year old CT scan all right then the 50 year old male with new featureless non-specific headache well someone who has non-specific headache we don't know how long it lasts but featureless meaning that there's no photophobia and phonophobia or anything else like it's just gradual onset and we need, to, we need to think about, well, we, it's, it's reasonable to do the CT scan, but should we, we should probably think about other extracranial diagnosis as well. Um, 
And if there are no extracranial severe causes and there is no intracranial severe causes, I mean, it's reasonable to, to do a CT scan for a new onset headache for a over 45, 50 year old male. That's usually a kind of, there's not a lot of evidence on it, but it's usually something in, in literature and, or male or female. And if that test is normal, then I will usually talk, say that to the patient that, well, to begin with, low risk that you have anything, and we're just doing this because it's a new onset, and you don't usually seek the emergency department for this. But if it comes back to normal, then have it, it, it. This this scan doesn't rule out any everything, right? So follow up with your primary care uh, physician if if it doesn't um, help, um, well, or if the symptoms don't go back within a few days or weeks, depending on the symptoms. You have your 20 year old female, right? Headache on off for the past year. Well, you may consider why did we do the scan here, right? This is like there are definitely um, young people who have serious, serious conditions on their scans, but once you've had on off headaches for a year and you don't have developed any other symptoms, then it's definitely a conversation about all of these false positives, incidence of omas, and low, low, um, like the true positives with a mild, in the mild end of the spectrum. Like knowing these risks before heading into a CT scan that will create radiation for a young person and maybe another modality is better, maybe an MRI or depending on what we're thinking, what we like, are we even, if, is it even the head? Is this biopsychosocial? Should we think about a lot of other stuff like the rough and tumble of life? Again, so this is not really clear. Um, and then the 70 year old male with headache and is, who is altered. That's always troublesome, right? If you're altered, there's a lot of dif different di differential diagnoses there. Um, and, um, but let's say that they're, if, if we got the background information that they're kind of, they're not on drugs, they're not altered for those reasons. Um, they usually, they're usually like not altered at all. Then it's reasonable to start off maybe with a with a normal CC scan, just to check that there's no big edema and there's no um, sub subdural head uh, hemorrhage or some of these like nuanced things that sometimes appear out of the, like like um, uh, gradually. Um, but we also consider we also consider that even if the CC scan is normal, we need to do more if they're altered for no reason, right? We need to think of medical medical um, conditions. We need to think of doing a lumbar puncture, so on and so forth, right? So we do that in Fagans normal again. The first one, well, goes down post probability. We can send that patient home. Next one, 50 year old male, new featureless uh, onset and uh, like featureless new onset headache. If that scan is normal, we can we don't know like this is not for all conditions. This is just a rough estimate, right? Uh, we can probably send that patient home and with decent follow up with our primary care physician. Then this one, I mean, she had a low pre probability to start with, and this test doesn't doesn't necessarily help her because of all of the biopsychosocial factors, right? Um, so also follow up with her primary care physician and probably talk her out of doing the CC scan in the emergency department if the headache is not worse today. And then the last one here, um, 70, year old, uh, 70 year old with a high previous probability of something wrong, right? But the CC scan doesn't really rule out everything, especially not with their altar and so on. The real case here and where the scans actually come from is from a um, is from the last one, a 70 year old male. Um, he had gradual onset fever and headache. He had uh, diabetes and hypertension. Lives at home with his wife. Never came in because of uh, of headache before. And the wife thought that he was altered. Um, and he had been so before with minor infections, so there may be some frailty involved in this as well, right? And he complains of headache. Having contacted uh, when we having the the, the the doctor that saw him hadn't contacted her, his wife for a history, and the headache was uh, like gradual onset, global over an aching, worse when lying down, but it was kind of variable and. and and the, the severity of it is like, I'm here, right? He's kind of a stoic patient. He doesn't just come in for no reason. 
not that anyone does, but like stoic patients that usually never come in <laughs> at all. And then it's constant, had a duration of one week, and it's featureless, there's no neck stiffness, no nothing, just a fever of 37.9. Well, this could be influenza, this could be a lot of things, but we always think about the time critical conditions in emergency medicine first, and if they're above a threshold of diagnostic, then we need to do the tests, right? And we need to know that this test, the CC scan, is not the last one um, for this patient. Neuro exam was normal, CT scan was ordered and it was normal as well. CRP was 40 and uh, SR was 20, the urine dipstick was negative. All right, so home if negative or? Well, this scan, if you look through it, then maybe there's something here. The problem is it's really in the midline and we often in CT scans of the head, we look for symmetry. And here, when it's in the middle, then there's kind of symmetry still. But well, we did the MRI on this guy and showed out showed to have a um, abscess. So so that's kind of the lecture on on this uh, topic. That the CC scan can lie in a lot of ways. It can persuade us in a lot of ways. It can and and. Behind all doors, both the false positives, the false negatives, the true positives and the true negatives lies a conversation with the patient. The scan doesn't lie. It doesn't tell you anything. You are the one who has to interpret these things in context of the pre-test probability that you take with your patient. So that's kind of the take home. All right, so no test without context. Before ordering the test, think of what you'll do if the test is negative and optimally convey that to the patient before doing the test. And it's not just the false negatives to worry about. As we talked about, true positives with overdiagnosis, incidental illness, um, true negatives, and discussion with the patient of whether we missed something or we didn't. Um, when they have serious symptoms, but a negative scan and um, false positives as well. well. So that's when the CC scan doesn't give you any answer. And let's just hear the last couple of minutes to talk about cases. So we always want to consider these time critical conditions when we are talking about emergency medicine, right? Um, and sometimes we want to consider these if they have a really good test that can specifically rule this test, this thing in, these thing, these conditions in, because then we can lower the risk of these by uh, uh, increasing the risk of these. So one of the, um, there's different mnemonics around and there are different areas of medicine well i'm just going to go through in emergency medicine where the cc scans can sometimes be mm, uh, quote unquote lying to you so one of them is orthopedics and if we think about the um the example i had in the beginning oh you have an angle that hurts then we do this x-ray and the x-ray is negative then we just send the patient home no we think about what you call the scared off mnemonic and i've detail this in, the, or in my orthopedic lectures. And this is not from me, this is from Arun Sayal, and I love that more and more doctors are talking about the probabilistics in emergency medicine. Arun Sayal is this great um, orthopedic interested emergency physician from Canada, and uh, he talks about this scared off mnemonic. So when you look at this, look at the scan and you don't want to miss uh, the false negatives, or any of the other conditions, then you think about scared off. And you can, like, especially EM cases have done a great um, a great um, episode about this, but there's several others here uh, from Iron Sayal where he goes through these. So the scared off the morning is when the x-ray is, is uh, like, and you use this when you have the patient that, especially if they have a high precess probability of something, but this x-ray is negative. The most common example that everybody intuitively know is 
if you have someone who's who's um, aching in their uh, in their snuff box a uh, snuff box tenderness and they're falling on, on outstretched arms and you may even have some kind of volar pain but the x-ray is negative then scaphoid fractures is the answer right uh, we need to cast that patient and then do an mri or something like that uh, in a week's time or so or whenever we can all right so s is um so our s when we have a um, we we the scared of the morning is all of the um dangerous conditions uh, that we don't want to miss even if the x-ray is normal here in on in orthopedics so this may be a septic joint it may be neck fascia, it may be post-operative infection it might be an open or closed fracture maybe a diabetic foot so on so like think of infections because they don't show up on x-rays necessarily sometimes there's gas on the neck fascia, but otherwise the reason why they come in and they're hurting in their joints that might be something else than just the trauma um right compartment syndrome um if they're hurting um in their muscles out of proportion um, then think about compartment syndrome um and then non-accidental injuries that's especially children or elderly like battered granny syndrome or battered child syndrome think about the uh, re red wrong or referred pain so if you have someone who hasn't who has pain for instance in their arm or their shoulder but you cannot reproduce the pain then you have to think about whether this could be an acs or referred pain from the uh, thorax in any other way so take home if you are unable to re reproduce the pain on exam be afraid of referred pain and think about what are the maybe medical medical conditions this could be and then red wrong of course our radiologists are not um perfect so they can read it wrong dislocations or subluxations not always apparent on the x-ray i think of the posterior um posterior um, shoulder dislocation that sometimes is missed on x-ray uh, it can also be sometimes that it has popped back in and if you have a knee dislocation that has popped back in then that's prior that's kind of uh, that's a really dangerous condition right um so just don't don't just order an x-ray and then send them home if it's negative also patella can sometimes yeah there, there, there's different like patella can be have, have jumped back in and sometimes when they have dislocations there you'll see some kind of small avulsion fractures or ligament fractures sorry avulsion fractures yeah but not always yeah and there's different ones here and operative soft tissue injuries meaning well um, a common one in the knee is the uh, quadriceps um, quadriceps uh, rupture right uh, they cannot raise their knee but this, uh, the x-ray is normal another one is um, the distal biceps tendon um, rupture um, where they don't have a where they have a negative hook sign but this x-ray is normal um, yeah there's different ones of these depending on where you are but um of course rotator cuff uh, injuries as well um and ligamental injuries and, and dru uh, j um injuries and in the um, ligament injuries in your in your wrist and so on um then you have occult fractures like occult in as in the x-ray that you order is not sensitive enough to rule them out that may be in the foot Liz Frank fractures and that's where we need to know about these conditions and what the predisposability are of them and what can rule them out and what not and then I usually add uh, scared uh, red off yeah and I usually add neurovascular damage that may be going to operate soft tissue but not necessarily if you have someone who has an artery uh, problem or if you have someone who has a neuro problem that needs to be considered as well even though it's uh, the x-ray is normal all right for headaches and um, which is some as you may notice is one of my favorite topics then um all of these are uh, just a sample of uh, headaches that are usually differential diagnosis for any patient with headache and then i've dealt it into different um different um, uh, syndromes like the thunderclap headache the extracranial headaches the systemic headaches the other intracranial ones and the pregnancy related headaches and then uh, the right the green ones this is where the like the normal ct scan without contrast can actually rule them out in a decent way 
uh, that's when there's a bleed usually and not a subarachnoid bleed um, but oftentimes a subarachnoid bleed and the orange ones is where the CT scan can rule them out but under specific circumstances so the subarachnoid for instance is within six hours and a mm, experienced radiologist with a good CT scan the RCVS needs a contrast CT scan, arteriography, the dissection also, arteriography, the CVST, vena venography, the um, spontaneous intracranial hypotension and MRI, and infarctions are usually rare uh, or non existent in isolation, headache, but you, infarct uh, always has other symptoms, right? Stroke symptoms, and uh, so on and so forth, like uh, in pregnancy as well. and. Uh, well, remember CC negative scans um, with preeclampsia, and there is this concept that the what you always like five diagnoses or four diagnoses you always have to think about in the CT negative headache and carbon, mon carbon monoxide carbon monoxide poisoning preeclampsia. Um, uh, Sin uh, venous sinus thrombosis and so on and so forth are some of the common ones, right? And dizziness, and I always already I, I also done a lecture on that. Dizziness, the short answer is CT is not the answer. <laughs> it's either MRI or your approach to the patient with a Hintz test. Um, and Hintz test in the appropriate population, right? Only the patients with acute vestibular syndrome with nystagmus, uh, spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus, uh, who is screened negative for uh, for severe features such as headache, neck pain, um, or uh, like uh, other severe features such as neurological symptoms, and that they should be able to walk and s sit without assistance. All right, please, if you want to know the entire algorithm here, um, then. Uh, check out peter john's videos or my videos on on this this is a algorithm from Cincinnati it's made by peter johns that's um but in in, in summary don't order ct scans on tc patients another place where the um the ct scan or the pci coronarography or any of the test may lie here is the uh, uh, clock pipe fallacy Meaning that if you just see a narrowing of the of the pipes in your coronary vessels, that doesn't necessarily carry any risk if you're if you're not in a um, if you don't have any symptoms. It's different from PC, if you have an ACS, but uh, if you just get it by chance, a screening test or whatever, then um, it doesn't necessarily carry any big risk other than maybe you need to work be worked up for. Um, coronary artery disease and not treated with PCI but treated with me optimal medical condition and medical um, treatment. There's lots of um, references where they talk about this in detail. But it's hard not to do anything when you see narrowing like this. You have courage trial, the orbital trial and the ischemia trial, all of them um, saying that just because you have this depends on the context, depends on whether you have ACS symptoms or inst and, and instable, including instable angina, or if you just have angina, then this probably, if you just have angina, then there's probably no reason to do anything about this. Um, at least this is a conversation with the patient about the risks and benefits. Um, and it's much more towards conservative management than it was before these trials. And if you want to know more about the, this mechanistic fa uh, fallacy, please check out a cardiologist and interventional cardiologist actually talking about these studies and talking about this in MetLife crisis here. And also another cardiologist who was talking about this for years before he died and they lost out of healing, Bernard Laun. And for abdominal CTs, um, this is the second to last slide, just saying the need for a contrast study on patients, especially at serial phase um, studies, increases with age, right? And uh, you can see this as an example here in just this uh, from EM cases, um, quick hits about renal, um, renal, uh, uh, renal uh, CT scans, who needs it? 
the ones who need it. If you're elderly and have a flank pain, then you always need a CT scan because you need to work up the aortic aneurysm. It's not always, always, but you really need to be careful with these patients, right? Common misses in in CT scans, just um, off the top of my head. Elderly vascular presentations usually are missed because you usually do a CT scan with venogram and not arteriogram and miss the mesenteric ischemia or, or the nuanced aortic aneurysm with the presentations. So know about the presentations of these conditions and the high risk in a lot of elderly people. Flank pain and CT scans, that's the same thing. Um, young women, well, ovarian torsion is not ruled out by a CT scan. Um, the like the pelvis and pelvic organs are usually best assessed by an ultrasound transvaginally. Young men, uh, neurology and like testicular torsion, sometimes you have belly pain or medical conditions as well, like DKA or Addison's crisis. That doesn't really have a CT scan finding. Gastric bypass, bypass patients where internal herniation it cannot be ruled out um, with a CT scan, even though there's a sensitivity around 90% um, and a high specificity, then it's not high enough to rule out if you have a lot of symptoms. Right? So you should, these patients usually need to be admitted no matter what the CT scan shows. If they if you don't find any other condition, that's... That, um, yeah, and then... Bile stones um, it has to be really, our stones have to be radio lucid and so on. All right, then of course you need to order the right phase. So that's the um, this lecture on when the CT scan lies um, or why we need to um, stop talking about the test is actually giving us the answer. It's not. We are the one who needs to interpret the test and then think about whether this is the answer that is right in the context or not. Thank you for listening.